55 years ago, the worst tragedy in British caving history happened in Conestone Moor, near Grassington. Six young men had excitedly set out to explore the furthest depth of a pothole labeled as one of the toughest challenges in the Yorkshire Dales. Half a century later, their bodies are still there, forever entombed within the darkness of Mossdale Caverns. There's a saying that Mother Nature is the most unforgiving and the most cruel of all disasters. When Mother Nature strikes, no amount of experience or special training can save a person. Surviving can only depend on luck. Unfortunately for six young men, their luck ran out the moment they entered the Mosdale Caverns one beautiful Saturday in June of 1967. They were William Frakes, Colin Vickers, David Adamson, Jeffrey Burrow, John Ogden, and the youngest, Michael Ryan. These men, aged between 17 and 26, were all experienced cavers, and two of them, Adamson and Burrow, knew Mossdale extremely well. Mossdale Caverns lies in the southern slopes of Great Wernside. It is an extensive cave system containing six miles of underground tunnels and passages. A river-like stream known as Beck disappears into the caverns at the foot of Mossdale Scar, and doesn't resurface until Black Keld on the River Wharf just south of Kettlewell. Among the many caves in Britain, Mossdale Caverns was one of the few classified as super severe. Its notorious cave networks are reputed to be very dangerous as they are prone to complete flooding. Many of the passages can only be crawled through while others are neck deep in water. 2.30 p.m. on a midsummer day, six unsuspecting young men entered Mossdale. They were accompanied by four others, Morag Forbes, Colette Lord, and cavers James Cunningham and John Shepard. Cunningham and Shepard were originally supposed to join the six men into the caves, but they saw the bleak sky outside and privately concluded that the weather was too dodgy and thunderstorms seemed likely. Adamson assured them that he knew where to stay safe. Cunningham and Shepard were feeling pressured. They thought that if Adamson asked again, they would agree to join them Luckily, the only two women in their company, Forbes and Lord, aren't cavers. They only wanted to sightsee. Cunningham and Shepard volunteered to accompany them. Just as well. Had they not done so, eight divers would have perished afterwards, instead of six. The two groups separated at the mouth of the cave, with Adamson's group continuing a strenuous journey deeper into the cave. They passed Drown or Glory Swims, squeezed through rough and knee-wrecker passages, and finally behind them is the 900 feet low and narrow Marathon Crawl, a tunnel which is only passable by wriggling sideways in the stream. Such were the challenges of this cave, and such were the thrilling reasons why many young adventurers like them dared to venture into this pothole. By 5.30 p.m., Cunningham's group emerged from the cave. The weather was starting to get wet, with small drops of rain dotting their shoulders and pebbling on top of their heads. The two men drove Lord back to Ingleton while Forbes took shelter in a barn. The cavers were not expected until midnight, but 22-year-old Forbes, from Leeds, stayed nearby. She was waiting for the 26-year-old Adamson, the oldest of the men and the leader of the party. He was also Forbes' fiancé. They were to be married the following month. Within three hours, the seemingly insignificant rain became torrential. Forbes went back twice to the entrance of the cave to scope out the situation. On her second return, she was horrified to find the beck overflowing and covering the cave's entrance. She immediately took off and ran about two miles to Yarnbury Farm, where Farmer Riley phoned the police. Inside the cave, the six young men heard the unexpected sound of the rushing water. It came loud and immediate. They instinctively crawled faster, but there's no way out. They were prostrate in a very narrow passage with the roof of the cave only a few inches above them. From the entrance of the cave, the water continued to rise, roaring its way in, bursting through cracks and invading through the smallest of gaps. With every terrifying inch that the water gained, the men's hopes of survival equally sinked. Cave rescues were a normal routine for the Upper Wharfdale Fell rescue team, but Mossdale is the one cave they dread having to face. Beyond their resources, UWFRA alerted the bigger cave rescue organization. Within minutes, 
Phones were ringing in Caver's pubs around the Dales. One phone call reached Martin Arms, where Cunningham and Shepard were enjoying a beer. Upon hearing what happened, they immediately grabbed their still wet gear and hurried back to the cave they exited just a few hours ago. From Yorkshire, Lancashire, Derbyshire, and Cheshire, other cavers joined the trek and drove out in the rain. Led by UWFRA and later joined by Cave Rescue Organization, hundreds of rescuers and volunteers converged at the foot of Mossdale Scar within the hour. Involving over 300 people, this rescue operation became one of the biggest ever mounted in Britain. Within a few hours, a convoy of fire engines, JCBs, and tractors arrived. That was the beginning of the hopeless rescue. Hundreds of people got on their knees and used both bare hands and whatever tool they found to dig a diversion ditch, six feet wide, 10 feet deep, and 100 yards long. In addition, they also built a 15 feet dam with a 15 feet thickness and a 70 yards length. It was extremely unstable. They had to reinforce it with 10,000 sandbags so it could withstand the force of the rushing water. Then came the weight. The rescuers were hoping for the water level to go down, but it was a race against time, and many believed that they had already lost. Jim Eyre, then 41, was among the most respected cavers in Britain. Adamson had asked him just a week prior if he would like to join the expedition, but Eyre balked at Mossdale. Mossdale is the one cave he swore he would never approach. It never crossed his mind that a week later, he would have to lead the main rescue team underground. By late Sunday, helped by 19 fire pumps, the water started to go down. Air led his sleep-deprived team down the still-gurgling cave. The traumatized Cunningham and Shepard were advised against coming, but they insisted. Frank Barnes, who was a close childhood friend of John Ogden, one of the six missing cavers, also joined in the very risky rescue attempt. The inside of the cave was grim. Debris was floating everywhere, and layers of foam filmed the roof. The team crawled as far as Rough Chamber, a room-sized cavern where they were able to stand. Around them, the water continued to sink. The volunteers outside were taking turns to constantly repair the shaky dam. It was the only thing keeping the cave from being flooded again. At last, the team reached Marathon Crawl. This 900-feet tunnel was only 10 inches high and 2 feet wide. It was too tight for the rescue team to pass through if they found survivors. In the end, Air elected London-based caver, Tony Waltham, to lead a few men in. It was Waltham who found the first two bodies jamming the passage. It was terrifying finding them, and a nightmare to crawl over them. Just beyond, Waltham found three other bodies, but one was still missing. Everyone was weeping. Some were retching when Jim Air finally caught up to the team. Phoning for guidance, Air was quietly told to speed everyone out. Things were looking bad outside. The dam, which already collapsed twice, was visibly trembling. Cavers in the stream formed desperate human barriers. The battle raged all night. They found five bodies except John Ogden, who they believed had somehow survived. Though struggling, the rescuers were unable to stop. It was essential that they determine Ogden's fate. They continued to comb the cave through Monday night and Tuesday. At 10 p.m., Brian Boardman, Another seasoned rescue leader spotted a gold ring. He squirmed around and saw a boot protruding from a fissure. It was very narrow, but Ogden had somehow made it there while fighting for the last inch of air. Like the others, he too lost his life. The weather worsened in the next few days, making it impossible for rescuers to retrieve the bodies. Despite protests, the coroner, Stephen Brown, conferred with the parents, police, and rescue leaders he obtained home office sanction for an inquest without bodies, then ordered the cave to be permanently sealed and be respected as a grave. Although officially sealed, friends of the victims got into the cave in 1970 and moved their remains to a high-level cavern, which they named the Sanctuary. In the end, there was no criticism of the young men's decision to venture deeper into the cave. Len Huff of UWFRA, one of the leaders of the rescue bid, said, their luck just ran out. The weather changes quickly in this part of the world. Six decades after its discovery, Mossdale still remains Britain's biggest caving challenge. If you have followed this story to this point, 
I would like to say a big thank you. If you like this kind of story, don't forget to hit the like button and leave a comment below. For more of this type of content, please click on the subscribe button and turn on your notification bell so you will be notified when another video is posted. Until next time, be cautious and don't ever lose your sense of wonder.